Okay, so thank you everyone for joining me today. I'm really excited to talk to you about how to prevent falls and offer some helpful tips. This is a discussion about four major areas of focus for fall prevention, and we'll share some helpful tips in each of those four areas. Before I start on the content, I wanna make sure you're aware that San Diego County Health and Human Services Agency, Department of Aging and Independent Services, hosts a fall prevention task force. This is a partnership between the public health agency of our county that's interested in preventing health issues with the aging population and private sector healthcare providers like myself who are also interested in improving the well being of the older adults in San Diego and um, preventing falls. So our mission for the task force is to reduce falls and their devastating consequences in San Diego County. We do have a website here, sandiegofallprevention.org, and you're welcome to join one of our monthly meetings on Zoom if you're interested to learn more at any point. It is open to the public. The introduction for today's talk is to go over three common myths about falls related to the aging process. Now we know that anyone can fall anytime. I'm sure if you have children or grandchildren, you've seen them fall as they were trying to learn how to walk. People can fall at any point if they trip over their dog or trip on a curb. So this can happen across the lifespan. But the reason we're focused on this for older adults, which is people 65 and older, is because of the risk of injury. So here are three myths regarding falls. The first myth is that muscle strength and flexibility cannot be regained. Now, while it's true that normal aging causes muscles to atrophy and it causes a reduction in muscle strength through exercise, both muscle strength and flexibility can be improved even in older adults. So a lot of people may never have exercise during their normal lifespan, but once they get over the age of 65, in order to combat normal aging of their muscles, it's, a, it's imperative for people to have an exercise program. The second myth regarding falls is that if you stay home, you can avoid falling. So we commonly see that when an older adult starts to fall, maybe their concerned children say, well, mom, just stop going shopping. Dad, stop going golfing. Just stay home and then you won't fall anymore. But that's a myth because most falls actually happen by slipping or tripping on a level surface inside one's own home. And that is data collected from all the trauma centers in San Diego County regarding people who presented to a trauma center with injuries related to a fall and they were able to plot out the, what, what the person was doing when they fell, and they found that most falls are occurring on a level surface inside their own home. So staying home does not prevent falling in itself. The third myth is that falls are a normal part of aging. Now to clarify, falls do get higher as people get older for a lot of reasons, medication side effects, loss of muscle strength with normal aging, as I already mentioned. So there are a lot of reasons why falls may increase in older people. However, it's not necessarily a normal part of aging because there are older people who are not falling. And we want to look at, for those who are falling, what can we do to reduce that risk? So regarding statistics, the statistics are that about one in four older adults are reporting falls every year. And this is with a health information survey. So this is where health information data collectors called older adults and pulled them. Not necessarily, uh, this data was not necessarily collected by an urgent care or emergency room or trauma center. So one out of four people that are falling are not necessarily presenting to the medical community for care. This is just people that were called by a health uh, information survey researcher and reported uh, a fall, whether or not they sought medical care. Um, 
Older adults who have at least one fall are also at a high risk of falling again. We know that about 50% of people who fall will fall again within six months. And then regarding injury, about 20 to 30% of those who fall will sustain a moderate to severe injury, which will prevent them from ever returning home or living alone again. And so just think for a second, if you know someone who's fallen, what kind of injuries do they get that might prevent them from returning home or living alone again? Well, commonly hip fracture is one. Uh, also traumatic brain injury is another. So uh, paralysis, spinal cord injury and, and lower body paralysis is another. So th these are injuries that we want to prevent um, so that people are not falling and then if they fall, they're not falling again, and then they're not getting seriously injured and having to move out of their house into a facility. So let's talk about what you can do to prevent falls. There are four major areas we're gonna cover today with helpful tips. One is speak up, and this has to do with working with your healthcare providers, specifically your primary care doctor. We know that those visits go really fast, and they come, the doctor comes with their own agenda of what they wanna to talk to you about uh, based on what your insurance requires for them to talk to you about. So you really have to advocate for yourself to bring up any concerns regarding your fall risk uh, when it's your turn to talk during that appointment. So we're gonna give you some tips on how to speak up with your healthcare provider. Also keep moving. This is to combat that normal changes with muscle, with normal aging. Get your eyes checked. We know that uh, vision is something that can be affected as people get older and that can cause falls. So we wanna get eyes checked regularly and then take steps to make your home more safe. So we're gonna go through each of these four areas and I'm gonna share with you helpful tips. So regarding speaking up with relation to working with your healthcare providers, the first, problem we see here that causes falls is chronic health conditions, excuse me, are chronic health conditions and medications. So what we're looking at here are chronic health conditions that may not be well managed. Okay. So for example, diabetes, high blood pressure, low blood pressure, irregular heartbeat, like atrial fibrillation, all these types of things. Typically you need very good medical management by your doctor. Now that could be a doctor, a nurse practitioner, or a physician's assistant. So any of those, I, I'm using the term doctor to represent either a physician, a nurse practitioner, or a physician assistant. I'll just use the term doctor for all three of those options. So you or your doctor needs to work with you to manage any chronic health conditions. Even arthritis, for example, is a chronic health condition that can lead to falls if not closely managed because people with pain from arthritis might walk with a gait abnormality, like they're limping to try to offset the pain and that can cause them to fall. Um, also chronic health conditions such as Parkinson's disease, multiple sclerosis, other more specific neurological conditions would need to be well managed between you and your doctor as a team. So this is what you wanna speak up uh, when you're with your doctor hey, what do I need to do to manage this health condition? Make sure you know what uh, you need to do to best manage your health condition to prevent falls due to medical conditions. And then medications can cause side effects that can contribute to falls. For example, dizziness and blurry vision are two of the most common medication side effects. So even one new medication can contribute to falls if it causes you to feel dizzy or it causes blurry vision, for example. So you want to make sure that you're monitoring yourself for any medication side effects when you start any new medications and report them to the prescribing doctor. So you're gonna speak up. You're gonna ask, what do you need to do to manage the health condition? Per perhaps there's a medication you should be taking. Make sure you know when to take it and take it on schedule, for example, if you've been given a blood pressure medicine to take twice a day, this is, this is a, an example I commonly see, you've been given a, a blood pressure medication to take one pill twice a day, and instead of doing that, you're just taking two pills 
once a day because that's easier for you. Well, that's not how it was prescribed. Okay. So that can cause the blood pressure to drop really low after the two pills and then get up high when you missed the second dose of uh, that you were supposed to take. For example, I've met patients that are doing that and they don't realize it's very important to take the medication exactly as prescribed by the doctor. And if you want to make any changes, you should discuss that with the prescribing physician. Also, if you feel concerned that you may be having drug interactions because you're on a lot of different medicines from different providers, then you can either take a list to your primary care doctor's office and ask them to check you for drug interactions, or you can ask the pharmacy, the pharmacist to check you for that as well. So you can have a professional check for drug interactions if you are concerned about that, which is a possible risk that can put people at risk for falling. So here are some other questions you can ask your healthcare provider specifically. One is, can, can my medication contribute to a fall? And that would be taking your current medications and supplements to your healthcare provider to review. Also ask about the possible side effects and combinations of the drugs that you're taking. So for example, some people are taking something over the counter that does the same thing as a prescription and they don't realize it. And I'm gonna give you a common um, example. So some people, if they've had a stroke or a heart attack, they're prescribed to take a blood thinner to prevent a future stroke or heart attack. And they may be taking a prescription for that, but then they may also decide on their own to take an aspirin. And maybe they also take garlic as a supplement, which garlic is a blood thinner as well. So then maybe their doctor doesn't even know they're taking aspirin and garlic in addition to the prescription strength blood thinner. So that's why when you go over your medications with your healthcare provider, you want to also include what's over the counter and wellness supplements, because you may be having a drug interaction from something that was not a prescription that you just decided to take on your own, or maybe one of your children suggested to you. Um, so you wanna also ask the doctor if your current health conditions can affect the risk of falling. For example, neurological problems, visual, cardiac, even mental health, we know there is research showing that people with depression, untreated depression, have a higher risk of falling. So sometimes mental health care is needed to reduce the fall risk. And then you can ask your doctor for referrals to other specialists as needed. You may need to see an eye doctor. Your, your, your doctor can refer you also potentially to physical therapy if you're having trouble getting out of bed and walking around, or you've noticed falls with walking or climbing stairs, loss of balance with walking and turning your head, things like that, that can be worked on in physical therapy or occupational therapy. So your doctor may be able to refer you for that. Um, in California, we do have direct access to therapy if you wanna pay out of pocket, but if you want your insurance to pay, then you need the doctor's referral definitely to get that insurance coverage. Some people need to take nutritional supplements to reduce their risk of falling. For example, a lot of vegans are uh, deficient in iron and B12, which can cause anemia and that can cause dizziness or lightheadedness for them and contribute to falls. So you may need to take certain dietary supplements or vitamins to reduce your fall risk, depending on the results of your annual blood work. So this is why it's important to get an annual physical and get the annual blood work to see what your vitamin levels are. Um, and then you may wanna ask your doctor what type of exercise is appropriate. I will warn you, a lot of doctors don't know because this is not their specialty area. So in that case, if they're not sure, they can refer you to physical therapy because that is our specialty. I'm a physical therapist. We specialize in designing exercise programs that are specific for people based on their medical and surgical history. So if your doctor's not sure what exercise you should do, you can ask to be referred to physical therapy for exercise prescription. Now, during your annual physical, um, the insurance typically requires your doctor to ask you these questions. Have you fallen in the past year? Do you feel unsteady when standing or walking? And do you worry about falling? 
And this is when you really need to speak up, okay? Because if you just say no, no, and no, then they're not gonna do any interventions regarding reducing fall risk because they're gonna think this is not a problem for you. But even if you haven't fallen in the last year, if you feel unstable with walking or standing, or you're worried, you have fear of falling, then you should tell the doctor because they may be able to make some referrals for you that are helpful to reduce your risk of falling. So we know that research has shown that people with fear of falling actually change the way that they walk and move around due to the fear and uh, it actually increases their risk of falling. So even though a fear of falling may be perfectly legitimate and reasonable, we want to address the fall risk to reduce that fear so that the person can then move around more normally, okay? So the second problem, we just covered speaking up and talking to your doctor to advocate for yourself, asking for appropriate referrals. Now, the second problem we'll discuss is physical inactivity. And again, fear of falling comes up in this section too. So when people retire, a lot of times they think they're going to live a leisurely lifestyle. And that includes sometimes more sedentary activities. So Instead of getting up and going to work every day, maybe they do a little morning chores and then they kind of sit and watch TV more than they ever did before. So that is a problem because the sedentary lifestyle, if you find yourself turning into a couch potato, then your uh, rate of losing muscle strength and your rate of muscle atrophy is going to be more and faster than just normal aging would do. So physical inactivity is something that puts people at risk of falling when they're over 65 and especially if they're retired and it can increase the risk, the fear of falling. So in order to be physically active, one of the first things we need to look at is the footwear. People can fall while they're exercising or walking and trying to be more physically active because they don't have the right footwear. So on the left side of the screen here, I have an X by the ladies high heels. I'm sorry to say, but that is not a good uh, choice for footwear for women over 65, just because your ankle can roll and then you can take a tumble and break a hip or break a, a wrist and that changes everything. So I've met a number of people who are dressed up to go to like the opera or the theater, for example, and, um, and fell because of high heels. So I always say my little slogan with this is, you know, um, flats look better than a hospital gown. Okay. So choose the flats and then hopefully you can avoid the hospital gown. Um, and then also for the guys, when you get dressed up, if you have dress shoes that are slick on the bottom, that don't have a good skid on the bottom, the bottom of the sole, if it's a slick bottom of the dress shoe, that puts you at risk of falling too. So the guys need to look for dress shoes. Like if you have to go to a wedding or some kind of fancy event, you should look for dress shoes that have a non-skid sole. And then the ladies should look for flats that are non-skid as well. In the middle here, there's a picture of a boot and the reason this is not a good choice, even though it does securely fasten to the feet with shoelaces, this is not a good choice because the, the sole is too thick and it's probably too heavy. So a really thick sole actually causes the person not to be able to feel the floor, which is called the ground reaction force. So any of you used to teach physics, you know about this. Basically, when you have your feet flat on the floor right now, you can feel the floor pressing up on your the bottom of your feet. You sort of feel pressure on the bottom of your feet from the floor if your feet are resting on the floor and you have normal sensation. But if the sole of the shoe is too thick, then that will block out the ground reaction force, which turns out to be the most important sensory input to prevent falls when someone is standing or walking on a level surface. So if you can't feel the floor through your shoe, then you're more likely to fall. Okay, so we want thin non-skid soles. And then all the way on the right side of the screen here, what's important in this picture is that the shoe securely fastens to the foot. So this is a slip-on. 
You can also get um, Velcro um, or you can get elastic shoelaces that stretch out due to the elastic when you put them on and then tighten back up. If you can reach your feet easily, you can wear regular shoelaces and just tie them up in a, in a bow or a knot. But uh, the key thing is you want the shoes to securely fasten to your feet. So if your choice is something like a flip-flop, that's okay because it's got a thin non-skid sole, but you need to have a flip-flop with a heel strap, okay? So that the flip-flop will securely fasten to your feet due to the heel strap. And the heel strap can be an elastic stretch or it can be a Velcro. Now, once you get your proper footwear, what should you be doing? The question is, what kind of exercise is the best to keep moving? And there's two answers to this. Regarding day-to-day -day activity, the most important thing is just get moving. Anything you do is better than sitting on the couch doing nothing. Okay, so um, like this shows a lady gardening. I remember about probably 12 years ago when I did a talk like this at the Bonita Library down in the South Bay, a woman raised her hand and she said, I clean my house from top to bottom every day, vacuuming, dusting, doing the dishes, mopping. Does that count as exercise? And I said, absolutely, because she's up on her feet. She's, she's doing things, she's bending, she's moving, she's reaching her arms out, she's using her core strength, using her legs. So she's moving to clean the house. And so that counts as physical activity. Gardening counts as physical activity. Even cooking a meal counts as physical activity because you're not just sitting. So that's an important thing is to space out activities throughout your day. And if you get tired, you can take rest breaks and pace yourself. You know, you say, okay, I'm gonna cook breakfast, then I'm going to sit for a little bit and rest. And then I'm going to do my next activity. And then I'm going to sit and rest. So you can pace out your activities if you're getting tired, but you want to kind of try to be active at least a couple times a day. And then um, as far as actual exercise, like cardio, what's the best type of cardio? Is it, you know, going to water aerobics? Is it walking with a friend? Well, the answer to that is whatever you're going to actually do. So whatever you like, that's the best because then you're going to do it, okay? So if you try to push yourself to do a type of exercise that you don't like, then chances are after a little while, you're gonna fall off the wagon and you're not gonna continue with that exercise. So you, you have to find something that you enjoy. Now, a lot of times if you can find a friend to exercise with in a group setting or a partners or pairs, um, format that's great because then you have some accountability and your your partner or your group will miss you and say hey where were you you missed class or why weren't you here and that sort of helps you stay in the flow of regular exercise um you can do now there's a lot of uh, exercise programs that you can do online in your own home um we have in san diego county some resources i'll share with you some tai chi a feeling fit club, which is strengthening, flexibility, balance, training, and cardio endurance. And those are free programs. Um, there's like the local YMCA has programs. And then if you're not sure how to get started with exercise, because maybe you just had a knee replacement or you had a cardiac surgery, then you would start with a physical therapist to get uh, your exercise program going and then maybe transition to working out on your own or in a group setting or even with a personal trainer. So regarding physical therapy, I want to make sure you all know physical therapists improve the way you move, okay? So physical therapists can have an education anywhere from a bachelor's degree, a master's degree, to now the doctorate degree. So any of those would be the education that launched them into the profession, depending on when they entered the profession. But all of us are licensed as physical therapists, and we all have the common goal of improving the way you move, meaning... You can get out of bed more easily. You can get up from the chair more easily. You can walk more easily. You can get in and out of the car, climb the stairs, walk up ramps, walk down ramps, all this kind of thing through physical therapy. So you can receive physical therapy at a clinic, like a private practice. This would be just a freestanding clinic somewhere near your house. You could receive physical therapy at a hospital-based outpatient rehab clinic where you would actually drive to a hospital, but you would walk in as someone who's not staying at the hospital, that's called an outpatient, 
and you would walk into the hospital-based rehab gym and do your therapy there. So those are two options of where you can receive outpatient therapy, either at a private practice that's not affiliated with a hospital or at a hospital-based outpatient rehab center. You can also receive physical therapy in the privacy of your own home if your doctor recommends it and you're considered homebound. There are some um, companies now that are also offering house calls to people over 65, even if they're not homebound through Medicare Part B. So um, you have the option to receive physical therapy in your home, which is nice and convenient. Wanna make sure you know about that. And again, if you want your insurance to cover it, you have to be referred by the doctor to someone who takes your insurance. If you wanna pay out of pocket, there are options for that as well, both in the home and at the private practice or at the hospital-based outpatient rehab center. Within the profession of physical therapy, there are specialists just like doctors. So, you know, you go to the general primary care doctor, your GP for your annual physical, your annual blood work. And then maybe if you have a heart problem, you also go to the cardiologist. So the cardiologist is a doctor, but they've specialized in heart problems. So within the profession of physical therapy, we have a similar clinical specialty pathway for different types of physical therapists, just like doctors can be, you know, cardiology, neurology, ear, nose, and throat, dermatology, urology. Physical therapists have similar um, specializations where we have extra training and skills that we acquired after we graduated with our physical therapy degree, the master's degree, the doctorate, or the bachelor's. So after graduation, while we were practicing physical therapy, we pursued training, mentorship, and uh, education within a specialty area. And therefore, within our profession, we specialized in a certain thing. Okay. So the one I want to make sure you know about is the vestibular specialty within physical therapy. This is not currently a board certification, but it's more of a clinical specialization. So for example, I've been a physical therapist now for over 20 years. I took my first training on how to treat the vestibular system, which is the inner ear. I took that in February of 2006. So I've been specializing in vestibular physical therapy now for over 16 years. Okay, but there's no board certification for that. So I can't tell you that I'm certified in that or anything, but this is my specialty. This is what I do all day long. And so therefore somebody with dizziness, vertigo or chronic falls that are unexplainable and balance problems would do better to see uh, a vestibular physical therapist, someone like me, than a general physical therapist who's more the general physical therapist is more going to do muscle strengthening, uh, give you a walker or a cane, maybe train you how to get out of bed, stand up from the chair, walk up and down stairs, get around and, and do basics of strengthening and mobility. But then if you have a specific problem, like you keep falling and nobody knows why, or you're dizzy or you're having spins or you feel off balance, then you may want to see a vestibular physical therapist. The reason is because the vestibular physical therapist is gonna do a root cause analysis to figure out why you're having these chronic falls and chronic balance problems. And there's different reasons. We can have um, problems with our inner ear, with our feet, with our eyes. There's so many different reasons that people can have um, chronic falls. The vestibular physical therapist is going to do a thorough root cause analysis. That's what I do for my patients, for example. They're gonna actually put their hands on you and test you for things. Whereas traditional medicine right now is really reliant on diagnostic testing. So if you go to the doctor and you say, I'm falling, they might send you for MRI, for blood work, for uh, x-rays, this and that, a bunch of tests. But because the time is so limited with the doctor, they may never put their hands on you and do actual physical testing on you to try to figure out why you're falling. They're gonna, rely, ha they're gonna have to rely more on diagnostic tests because of the limitation in time that doctors have with their patients these days. Whereas physical therapists, we tend to spend more time with people. We have usually about 30 minutes minimum for a new patient, sometimes 60 minutes. I spend two and a half hours with my new patients in person. And prior to that, I'm on the phone with them 
for anywhere from 30 minutes to an hour the day before. So I'm looking at three to three and a half hours that I spend with a new patient doing a complete analysis and exam. So the physical therapist is going to spend more time and do hands-on uh, tests that can help figure out why you're falling or why you're dizzy. So I want to make sure you know that if you are noticing dizziness, vertigo, which is like a spinning feeling, uh, imbalance or disequilibrium, like when you're up on your feet, you just feel really unstable or chronic falls that you cannot attribute to a specific cause. Like you can't say, oh, I tripped on the electrical cord. That's why I fell. You're just like, I don't know what happened. I just all of a sudden fell out of the blue. That's a chronic unexplained fall if it keeps happening. So you can find vestibular physical therapists and actually also doctors that specialize in those problems at this website, vestibular.org. So I want to make sure you know about that because um, depending on where you live, you may want to find a provider closer to home or find someone who takes your insurance. And vestibular.org has a healthcare provider directory that you can type in your zip code or your city and state and then hit search and look for someone who you can uh, go to for that root cause analysis and hands-on exam, okay? So that has to do with um, maintaining your mobility. If you're having trouble with mobility um, and you're having trouble keeping on moving or exercising because you're dizzy, because you're off balance, you would go to either general physical therapy for exercise prescription and general mobility training, like getting you a walker or a cane, or you could go to a vestibular physical therapist if you're noticing chronic falls, imbalance, dizziness, or vertigo. So those are all strategies to keep you moving, okay? Because we don't want you just on the couch all day or in the bed all day with your muscles wasting away, and then uh, that can increase your fall risk. Now, the third major category we're going to cover today is poor vision. Uh, this is the problem. So we've talked so far about two categories. We talked about speaking up with regards to managing your chronic health conditions and your medications. Talk to your doctor about appropriate referrals. We also talked about the importance that you keep moving and we covered proper footwear, a discussion about being active throughout the day uh, here and there, and then maybe types of exercise that you might try individual in partners or in groups. And then we talked about going to physical therapy if you're not sure how to get moving or uh, also going to vestibular physical therapy if you have dizziness, vertigo, or chronic balance problems. And that was under the categories of speaking up to your doctor and keeping moving. Okay, those are the first two major categories we covered. Now we're going to cover the third category, which has to do with getting your eyes checked. So it's recommended for older adults, this is people over 65, to get their eyes checked once a year to make sure that their glasses are appropriate and they have the right prescription. Vision can change with normal aging of the eyes, okay? You can have normal aging changes with vision, that happens to everybody. You can also have eye diseases that might need to be managed by a doctor, like glaucoma, cataracts, macular degeneration, or diabetic retinopathy, in which case you would see the ophthalmologist regularly for the vision and do eye drops or whatever they recommend for that. So we get our eyes checked annually when we're over 65 because of normal changes to the eyes with aging. We wanna make sure you have the right glasses. And then we go to the ophthalmologist regularly if we have eye diseases or need to get our eye health checked, okay? And then we also have, um, we know that with cataracts, what's called first eye cataract surgery, meaning the first eye you get corrected, does have an impact on reducing fall risk, which is, which is great. So the solution to poor vision is getting your eyes checked, um, making sure that you have an optometrist who can help you with the glasses, and then an ophthalmologist for your eye health, if, especially if you have eye diseases that need ongoing monitoring. Now, I will tell you uh, regarding this that sometimes people can just not adapt to progressive lenses or bifocals or trifocals. So if you feel dizzy after you got progressives, bifocals or trifocals, and it just won't stop, then maybe that's not the right uh, split screen vision is not right for you. You may need separate pairs of glasses for reading and for regular 
uh, for near and far vision because some people just cannot tolerate bifocals, trifocals, and progressive lenses. And for some people, it can cause dizziness. The other thing I want to mention, if you wear bifocals, trifocals, or progressive lenses, is that when you navigate up and down curbs, steps, or inclines, you may have a depth perception issue uh, placing your foot up on a curb if you're looking down through the reading portion of your split screen lens. So, so if you have a bifocal, a trifocal, or progressive lens, and it's fine, it's working fine, that's great because you don't have to switch your glasses all the time for reading. But then if you go to climb up a curb, a step, or an incline, be beware that you don't look through the reading portion of the lens, which is the lower portion of the lens, because when people do that, then they miss the step because it's not the right magnification for that distance, and then they can fall. So this happened to my grandma, for example. She called me probably about 10 years ago and said, I just fell outside CVS. I'm on the ground on the sidewalk. And sure enough, she had on her bifocals, and she had looked right down through the reading lens and then just totally missed the step. So the solution, she missed the curve, excuse me. So the solution is to either, uh, to just tip your chin down so that your, your, your head is angled down the way you're looking. And then you can look out through the correct part of the lens to see the curve instead of looking through the reading lens, okay? So just be aware of the fall risk with those glasses. Now the fourth uh, area that we're gonna discuss helpful tips is environmental hazards. So let's look at these four examples of common environmental hazards that can cause falls in older adults. Okay, on the upper left corner of the screen, you see that dark ballroom. With normal aging of the eyes, people need more light to see what they used to be able to see with less light. Therefore, with normal aging of your eyes, you may need to increase the lighting in your house. So uh, this type, type of dim lighting may not be sufficient to prevent falls. So a lot of people have to add additional lighting or use reading lights or headlamps or things like that to increase the lighting in their home as they're getting older to prevent falls. And this is especially important if you're getting up at night to go to the bathroom, that you have a lighting system. You can have motion activated lights, you can have bathroom lights, you can have a flashlight or a headlamp or just use the flashlight on your phone but you need something to light your way to the bathroom at night. You should not be walking to the bathroom in the dark. So night lights are a common um, addition that people will make as they're getting older in the bathroom. The second picture here, second from the left in the bottom there is a puddle. So this is a common cause of slipping and falling in the home. If say the dog urinated on the floor and you didn't realize it, um, or if somehow there was a leak in your water cooler and it leaked on the floor, you didn't see it. Um, and this can cause a slip and fall accident. Um, so this is really important to make sure the, the floor is not slippery. Um, and also if you have your floors waxed, like if you have type of flooring that you get polished or waxed can cause slip and fall injuries as well. So just be aware of the risk of falling if you see a slippery floor and just uh, either try to avoid it or um, take steps to uh, remedy that situation before you step on it. The third picture here is the clutter. And this is especially common when people move out of their own home into an apartment or condo in an assisted living or senior living um, community. Because what happens is they wanna keep all their furniture you know what I'm talking about, right? They wanna keep all their furniture. They don't wanna get rid of any furniture, but it doesn't all fit. And so therefore, as they downsize from the house to the condo or the apartment in the senior living community, the it's very cluttered, okay? Because they're trying to keep everything and maybe they haven't been able to sort through stuff, um, but mostly it's the clutter of the furniture that we need to be aware of that can cause falls. So. In and around the home, it's important that you can walk through all the walkways facing forward without having to turn your body sideways and shimmy sideways to get between furniture, okay? And then it's also important just to clear the clutter off the floor, make sure there's nothing on the floor that can cause you to trip and fall, especially on stairs. 
And then the final thing over here that shows this boot catching on the throw rug. It is very common for people to fall because their foot gets caught on a throw rug or because the throw rug moves when they step on it. So some solutions here would be get rid of the throw rug. A lot of people don't like that solution because they like their home as is. So if you wanna keep the rugs, um, then you can use double-sided tape to securely um, anchor them down to the floor. You just really need them along the edges and corners. You can also put a non-skid piece of material under the rug so that when you step on it, it doesn't slide. Uh, if you don't wanna tape it down and put adhesive that could ruin your floor. Um, so you can either tape the edges or you can put a non-skid piece of material under the rug or you could get rid of it altogether. Those are all good options for throw rugs, but they do cause falls when people trip on them. As far as more solutions to make your home safer, there are a lot more things that you can do. This actually um, sometimes is a whole lecture in itself, what to do in each room of the house. So we do have this home safety checklist that the Fall Prevention Task Force has put together for you to use in your own home, like you're a home inspector and just check each room to make sure you've taken steps to reduce the risk of falling. And uh, I will send the most updated one to Susan after the talk and she can share it with you so that you can use that as a reference. We're not gonna go room to room because that's not the focus of this talk, but I just wanna let you know there are suggestions and solutions for different rooms, including outdoor walkways, flooring, stairs and steps, bedrooms, bathrooms, and different types of lighting solutions. Here are some examples of common pieces of equipment that people might purchase to reduce the risk of falling in their home from environmental hazards. Now, I will tell you that um, this all is fairly inexpensive. We're not talking about a big home remodel here. We're just talking, you know, if you put this grab bar in, for example, in your bathroom, you can get one of these um, probably for like $50, maybe even less. You can get a decorative one that looks like a towel rack, but yet it's screwed into the studs. So if you grab it, it won't fall out of the wall. Um, and, you know, they have really nice grab bar options now that you can put in your bathroom that you cannot even tell it's a grab bar, but you know it's screwed into the studs. Uh, it looks like a towel rack or it looks like a toilet paper holder, for example. But the difference is if it's bolted into the studs in the bathroom, then it can support your body weight. Okay, so a lot of people will put grab bars outside their shower. If you need to sit down in the shower, you can use a tub bench like this on the left bottom corner, or you can use a shower chair if you have a smaller shower stall. And then you would need a handheld shower hose, which is in the upper right corner here, so that you can control the flow of water while you're sitting down. Uh, and this is especially nice if you uh, feel off balance or afraid of falling in the shower. And then uh, some people will have trouble picking things up off the floor. Um, and so this reacher and grabber in the upper left corner is a common tool people might use. We also have the occupational therapist might have something like a sock aid or an extended length shoehorn um, that can help you get your socks and shoes on if you have trouble bending over to reach down to your feet. And then of course, one thing that's really important is for people to think about if I do fall, so worst case scenario, if I fall and I find myself on the ground and I cannot get up, how am I gonna get help? Because we don't want people on the ground for days at a time without the ability to call for help. So, you know, you can come up with different solutions for this. I had one patient who had a plan with her across the street neighbor Every morning by 7 a.m., they would both open the blinds of their front living room, and every night at a certain time, they would both close the blinds. So then if one of them missed opening the blinds or closing the blinds, the other one would call and check and maybe call the children of that neighbor to go check on them. So that was sort of a very subtle way to just keep an eye on your neighbor, make sure that they're still up and around and about doing their normal daily business. Um, sometimes people will have a child an adult child that calls and checks on them once a day, or they'll have a friend they check in with. We also have um, a lot of the cities in San Diego have programs where you can have a volunteer call you once a day to check on you. 
Uh, we have different programs like that. I know I met some gentlemen that were doing that in Vista, for example, um, calling people that had requested it once a day just to check on them, make sure they were okay. So we have different um, options for checking on you, but if you would rather have a way to call for help on your own, then you can either keep your cell phone on you all the time, which works if it's charged, and if it doesn't break, if you fall on it and smash it, that's the risk of the cell phone is that it could run out of battery or it could break. But then a lot of people are getting these emergency response buttons, which you see in the bottom right corner here. Most of them come with a waterproof pendant that you can wear around your neck or a wristband and you keep it on even when you're in the shower. That's why it's waterproof because a lot of people fall in the shower or after getting out of the shower because they're all wet. So um, that's an option. Those are definitely private pay. There's a few options for emergency response um, services. I think the monthly fee can be somewhere around $50 a month, give or take, uh, and you may be able to find something cheaper than that. But the question you wanna ask them is, do they have um, the ability for you to call for help if you're outside your house? So some of these emergency response systems are hooked up to satellites, meaning even if you're down the street at Starbucks or at the supermarket and you have a problem, you can press the button it'll call through the satellite and it'll still activate the emergency response system. But other services only uh, work within a certain perimeter of your home because they're not hooked up to the satellite, they're hooked up to like a call box in your house and you have to be a certain number of feet away from that in order for the button to work. So the question you wanna ask is, is this gonna work if I have a problem when I'm in the community or is this only gonna work if I'm actually in my house or around my yard? and figure out which is the best service for you if you sign up for something like that. And I will add uh, a good idea is to either give a key to a neighbor or a, a friend that can give it to the fire department if someone has to respond to your home due to a fall because you're not gonna be able to get up and open the door and you don't want the fire department to have to break down your door because uh, then you have to repair that. So you wanna have somebody needs to have a key or the other thing a lot of people are doing now is using a lockbox. So you can get a lockbox from like Home Depot or Lowe's. It's not that expensive. You set a code, put a copy of your house key in the lockbox and have it somewhere on your property and then give the code to your fire department, your local fire department or your um, emergency call button company. And then if the fire department has to respond to your house, they can get the code for your lockbox, which is usually pressing a few number of buttons on there, pop the lockbox open, get the key to your front door and open it so that they don't have to break your door down or damage a window or anything like that to get to you. Okay. Now, what kind of um, programs do we have in San Diego to help you with preventing falls? Well, I'm excited to say that Aging and Independent Services has a lot of great programs. You can learn about the different programs on this website, healthierlivingsd.org. And I will also send out some flyers in addition to the home safety checklist that I promised, I'll send out some flyers with updated programs that are free and offered by the county uh, that can help prevent falls. For example, we have something called the Feeling Fit Club. You see this picture here on the right with so one lady sitting down, two ladies standing up, they're doing exercise. This is a free program that's offered uh, for San Diego County older adults, and it focuses on balance, strengthening, flexibility, and endurance. So it has those four components of fitness, and they, they can mail you a DVD with this and an exercise band if you contact the county, or you may be able to watch it on your local access cable station. It's on usually three times a day, like 8 a.m., 1 p.m., and 4 p.m. on whatever your local access cable station is, if you have cable, or you can watch it on DVD. And before the um, pandemic, they had a lot of live sites where you could go exercise. I'm not sure how many of those have resumed now, but you can definitely do the Feeling Fit Club in the privacy of your own home uh, through the TV or DVD. We also have Tai Chi programs, which are for reducing the risk of falls through improving balance. That's offered by San Diego County. And then they have some educational programs for people with chronic health conditions that can contribute to falls because sometimes doctors don't have time to teach you everything you need to know. 
So for example, San Diego County offers a program called Healthier Living with Diabetes. They offer, um, I think, Healthier Living with Chronic Pain, and they offer Healthier Living with Chronic Health Conditions, and that can be any health condition. And they help you work through understanding your health condition, knowing how to manage it, and what your responsibility is to keep that health condition under control, and that will in turn reduce your risk of falling. So these are free evidence-based programs offered by the county. And you can learn uh, what's available up to date at healthierlivingsd.org. So just to review, we talked about four major categories that you can go through to reduce your risk of falls. I offered you helpful tips in each category, speaking up, keep on moving, check your eyes and make your home safer. And in each of those four categories, I offered helpful tips. Um, not all the tips might apply to you, but I will tell you that the research is clear that if all you do regarding fall prevention is receive education, like what I'm giving you today, just receiving education by itself does not reduce your risk of falling. But if you implement steps, action steps to follow through on some of the tips I've suggested, then you will get into reducing the risk of falling. And the exciting thing in the research by Mary Tonetti, who's a researcher in the state of Connecticut, she found that the more steps you take to reduce your risk of falling, then it has an exponential impact on your fall risk. So it's not a linear one-to-one -one relationship that for every one step you take to reduce fall risk, it's going to be a directly proportional impact on your, fall, on your fall risk to reduce it. No, it's an exponential relationship, meaning the more steps, action steps you take to follow through on the tips I shared, it will reduce your fall risk exponentially because a lot of these things are interconnected. Okay. So um, I want to encourage you to take action on the helpful tips that I shared that are related to your specific situation. And then, you know, you can disregard the rest, but the more tips that you implement, the more likely you are to reduce your risk of falling. If you would like to learn more from me, I wanna let you know, I've done UCSD public, Stein public lectures three times, um, once on taking steps to prevent falls, that was in 2016. So most of that information should be up to date, but it, the statistics and things like that may be a little outdated. Um, that's a, a little bit uh, of a different focus lecture, but it has a lot of overlapping content to what we talked about today. So that's available on UCSD's website, UCSD TV. And then I did two lectures on dizziness and vertigo specifically. The one right in the middle of your screen here with the picture of the brain and the eye and the neck, the ear and the foot. That's my most popular lecture online. It's about an hour and a half. It was about an hour presentation and about 30 minutes of question and answer, which was good, good questions by the audience. And um, that now has over 3 million views on UCSD's YouTube channel. So you can find that on UCSD TV or on the YouTube channel. And then I have part two, all the way to the left side of the screen, dizziness and vertigo part two. And you can uh, learn more, uh, if you wanted to watch that video as well on dizziness and vertigo. But if I would recommend if you want to watch the one right in the middle, dizziness and vertigo research on aging part one, that seems to be helping a lot of people. I've gotten a lot of positive comments on that. The people said, wow, I really learned a lot from that talk about why I might be dizzy, why I might have vertigo, what I should do about it. So if you have, if you wanna get in touch with me, you're welcome to contact me through my website, which is Better Balance in Life. Dot com. So I do have a contact form on that website. Um, you're welcome to contact me, send me an email, and I'll respond with free, helpful information and resources. I also have on this website, Better Balance in Life, um, and my second website, I have almost 200 blog articles that I've written on these topics, dizziness, vertigo, balance problems and falls, and what to do about it. So I have a lot of free articles and information on these topics as well. Um, and here's the contact information for the San Diego Fall Prevention Task Force. If you want to say, join a meeting, we have a monthly meeting uh, from one to 2 p.m. 
on a Tuesday. I think it's the second Tuesday of every month. Don't quote me on that. I'm not sure if it's the second or third Tuesday of the month because it's on my calendar as a repeating meeting and I don't know which Tuesday it is, but it's from one to 2 p.m. It's on Zoom. And if you wanted to, to log in and join and see what we're talking about and how we're the public health uh, authorities in San Diego are working with the private healthcare providers like myself, and we're collaborating to advocate to reduce falls for older people throughout San Diego County. If you wanna be part of that, or you wanna just observe, you're welcome to log into our Zoom and check us out. You can also email AIS at this email, call them, and then you can see our website, which has, that has the details about when our meeting is, sandiegofallprevention.org. So now we have some time for questions. I'm gonna stop sharing my screen and I'll ask uh, my colleagues at the uh, UCSD Center to help me with um, facilitating the Q&A. Yep, and, and thank you so much. This was absolutely wonderful, Dr. Bell. So much information. I will let everybody know in advance that when we send out the recording of this event, we will also include all the links of all of the programs that Dr. Bell uh, mentioned. So I'll look them up and I'll include those links as well as the information that she's going to be sending me um, with the task force recommendations and checklists okay. for your home. So Perfect. be on the lookout for that uh, for that email from us. Great. So if any of you have uh, questions, please raise your hand electronically or we're a small enough group that you could just go ahead and vocalize. Um, any question you may have. I'll jump in there, Dr. Bell, and that is, I do recall that previously you used to have sort of a, a, a starter package. If somebody wanted to reach out to you and have a consult, could you share a little bit about um, how that's handled? I yes. know it's a private pay, right. and, uh, you don't do insurance, but if you could share a little bit about that, that'd be helpful. Yes, sure. So um, so basically, if somebody does have insurance that will cover them to see physical therapy, especially vestibular physical therapy, which is what I do, if they have insurance that will cover that and they haven't tried that yet, I do encourage them to do that first, because if they can get it for free, you know, then that's better than paying out of pocket. So typically, I'll encourage people to do physical therapy that's covered by their insurance as the first step. Um, unless they've already gone through that and kind of hit the plateau or not gotten the results that they want. Um, and then basically, if you go to betterbalanceinlife.com, you can, um, in the header of that website is a purple button that says request a consultation. So you just click on that purple button, request a consultation. It'll take you to the page that um, has my pricing on there and um, explains the limitations and restrictions to the care that I provide. For example, I don't provide consultation through video or phone. I don't think I can do a good job with that with my specialty. So my care is all provided in person. And I do have an office in downtown Encinitas. Where it's a private practice where I see people. And then I have some therapists who work for me that can do house calls as well if people need care in the home. But it is all private pay. so. If somebody is interested in working with me, they would click on the requ request a consultation button, read about the limitations and restrictions of the care we provide and the pricing. And I can tell you for me, the, the initial consultation fee is $5.95. And that includes a phone interview, which is anywhere from 30 to 60 minutes. Usually it's about 60 minutes for me to go over all the medical history. And then we meet a day or two later at my office for a two to two and a half hour visit, which includes a whole physical exam plus treatment and education. So it's about a three to three and a half hour time commitment together to do the initial consultation. And that's for $5.95. And then um, at that point, if I think the person's care can be sufficiently provided by another physical therapist or doctor who takes their insurance, I will refer them back to somebody who takes their insurance if I think that it's not something they can find through insurance, then I will schedule follow-up visits with them. And they'll come to my office about once or twice a week for care, usually for about three to three to four, maybe five weeks. So it's a pretty short um, treatment period, but um, usually six weeks or less is a pretty standard uh, treatment period. And I do a lot of education and um, 
give a lot of handouts, teach a lot to people so they don't worry and they know exactly what to do with regards to their specific uh, condition. And have you successfully treated people and kind of gotten them from a point where they were afraid to, you know, get up and out uh, and gotten them past that? Yes, I have. I have. And, you know, I have a, um, I have some patients that when they come to me, it looks like maybe they've had a stroke or something. And therefore it's not appropriate at this time for them to work with me. They probably need to go to the neurologist and get a brain MRI or something like that. So that does happen every once in a while that it's not the right time for me to work with somebody. And therefore after the initial visit, I have to send them to a medical doctor, like a neurologist most commonly, or maybe cardiologist for uh, intervention and testing regarding their dizziness. So that does happen sometimes. Not everyone turns out to be appropriate for my care, but um, yes, I would definitely say I have a lot of success rate. Um, I mean, as people get older, it, it, it is the slower progress than, you know, say a, a 18 year old patient, you know, that I have on my schedule tomorrow, for example, that's a little faster because, uh, you know, the brain is, is, um, younger and easier to recover. Uh, we all know it's easier to recover when you're younger, but older people certainly have potential to reduce, if not completely eliminate their feelings of dizziness, vertigo, and imbalance. Uh, even with a little more work, but if they're willing to put in the effort, I'm willing to put in the effort. And um, I just had somebody come from out of state from Colorado to see me for three visits for a week. And he got back home and said, that was absolutely worth it. That was so beneficial. I'm so glad I came there. And he was someone who had kind of hit the wall with everything that they offered in where he lived through insurance. So he said, coming to see you is my last resort. And it turned out to be a good use of his time. I was worried, to be honest with you, what if I couldn't help him? But it turned out that through spending three visits with me in a week, he was able to get a lot of help. And then he has a plan now for what to do now that he's back home. So, so yeah, I tend to be the last resort for a lot of people. And, and I'm happy to do that because I want them to use their insurance as much as possible to get it, get whatever they can get for free before they start paying out of pocket for my care.